Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Breast Cancer Podcast. Hello, I'm your host, Dr. Deepa Hala Harvey, a fellowship trained breast surgeon, and also happen to be a breast cancer survivor, thriver, and a warrior living my best life. As you know, breast cancer affects millions worldwide, touching lives in a profound ways. Whether you're someone facing a diagnosis or a supporter seeking information or just eager to learn more, this podcast aims to be a beacon of understanding, hope, and empowerment. I'm here to talk about all things breast cancer, from surgery to survivorship, as well as high risk for breast cancer to metastatic breast cancer. My goal is to provide you with reliable information, share inspiring narratives, and foster a supportive community. I know firsthand the challenges breast cancer diagnosis brings. Throughout this podcast, I will give you strategies to handle difficulties that arise from cancer diagnosis. We'll have insightful conversations with medical experts, researchers, survivors, caregivers, and advocates. I will tackle topics that impact our lives as cancer survivors. My goal is to educate you and empower you to live your best life. I definitely have. Well, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our breast cancer podcast, the best podcast ever. And we are talking about the breast plastic educational series. And we are on the second episode today. We had did one a few weeks ago and that was really successful. And I've had really great feedback. How are you doing today, Dr. Tiwari? I'm doing well. I rounded on a few patients, did some phone calls, and now I'm ready to talk about breast cancer on our breast and plastic surgery podcast. Yes. So I believe the first episode we talked about, you know, what we do and how our day goes, you know, like what is your day comprised of and um, what we do at work, uh, so on and so forth. So and we learned a lot about each other, things that I didn't know about you. <laughs> that was fun. I know. I know. Um, since then, I've been trying to not eat. I am following the three to one rule that you had. <laughs> So, so that has been good. So I've learned from you and, um, you know, I've read like so many books uh, about the importance of having a routine, whether it's morning or evening routine. And, um, I think, you know, it kind of solidified for me. Okay. This is really important for your brain, uh, to get used to a routine, whether it's in the morning or night, um, uh, especially getting good amount of sleep, you know, before a long day at work. So. Well, you know, today I think we can uh, really hone in on some of our day-to-day, -day, not before the operating room, but maybe what we do in the office and yes. give people a sense of how uh, do we come to see patients, um, what are the types of people that we see, you know, in the breast cancer office and the plastic surgery office. Yes, that is correct. So I wanted to see um, what are some things patients should know when they come to see you. Um, patients are diagnosed with cancer and what are some things that they should prepare and then how the typical consultation goes with you. Uh, but before that, I'll tell you like how I diagnose a patient with breast cancer. Patients typically come to me with uh, an abnormal mammogram or a breast mass or some sort of breast complaint. I work that up and I typically get a biopsy. And I do want to say most common biopsy result is benign. So most common mass a woman feels is benign. It's not cancer. So I want our listeners to know that just because you're feeling a mass doesn't mean it's cancer. So can I ask you a question here, Dr. Hallerby? Yes. Do you, um, are most patients coming to you because they feel a mass or are most patients coming to you because they've had imaging for a screening mammogram and they then have something that's concerning? Yes, that's a very good question. The most common presentation for me is a patient who comes in with an abnormal mammogram. So be di I diagnose a lot of early stage breast cancer that is not being felt on a physical exam. So most common patient that comes with an abnormal mammogram, whether it's calcifications on a mammogram or architectural distortion or a mass on a mammogram, and then they will also have an ultrasound, which then shows a suspicious mass if it's now, going to be cancer. 
How old should patients be before they start getting their screening mammograms? Yes, that's a great question. So, because um, it's a little that, controversial, I, I think. Yeah, there are so many organizations in our country, uh, and it's really confusing. The guidelines keep changing. We follow NCCN guidelines, uh, National Cancer Comprehensive Network guidelines, which recommend an average risk woman to start mammography at age forty, and that is a patient who does not have family history of breast cancer and is not considered high risk for breast cancer. Answer. So if you have a family member who's diagnosed with breast cancer, say age 50, you want to start at age 40. Or if you have a family member who's diagnosed with cancer at age 40, you want to start your mammography at age 30, in addition to possibly getting an MRI, because the younger a woman is, the denser the breast is, and it's easy to miss cancer. And I'll, I'll we'll talk so about e that too. Even in somebody who's who has a family history where someone was diagnosed in their 40s, will get screening when they're in their 30s. If Yeah, so I was diagnosed breast cancer at 40 myself. So my daughter is going to start her screenings at age 30. Oh, so okay. I did it's not know 10 that. years. Yeah, it's 10 years younger than the family member who's diagnosed with breast cancer. Hmm. So um, if you have a family member, first degree, second degree relative, so your mom, your sister, your maternal aunt, your daughter, they're all like first, second degree relatives. You want to start your imaging with mammography or MRI or both at 10 years younger than the family member who's diagnosed. Got it. So patient comes in, they've had something odd on their mammogram and now they're seeing you in the office. They're scared. You know, you're very comforting, but how do you, how do you approach this conversation with them? Yeah. I mean, almost every patient that comes to see me, unfortunately, they're scared. And because the worst thing they're thinking is they have cancer and they're going to die from cancer. So they've already decided this is what's happening for that day. So I see them. I go through their family history, their past medical history, the medications that they take. I do a physical exam. I review their imaging and I show them the imaging. And I kind of point out to the structures on the imaging if something that looks worrisome on a mammography, whether it's a, what we call pleomorphic calcifications or asymmetry, spiculated lesion, these are all medical words for what we see on a mammogram. On an ultrasound, it could be a lesion that's taller than white. Typically, it looks like a Christmas tree on an ultrasound. Their ultrasound works by using sound waves. So when you use a probe, when there is a suspicious mass, the sound waves do not penetrate through the mass. So it creates the shadowing behind the mass. And it looks very irregular and that's worrisome for cancer. But most common things I see are calcifications that are benign, meaning 80% of the women who come in to me to see me with calcifications have a benign biopsy results. A mass that is round and uh, well circumscribed, meaning the edges look fine. Those usually typically come back benign. So the vast majority of people that see you, it's benign. They yes. don't have cancer. So just if they've, if, they're needing to see you. There's no reason to freak out because the chances are yeah. that it will not be a cancer. Is that yeah. my understanding of that correctly? That is very correct. Yes. And also in the United States, the most commonly we are diagnosing women, thankfully, because of screening mammography. And these are diagnosed at early stages. So say you're diagnosed with cancer, early stage cancer, your prognosis is great. Um, I was diagnosed with a stage one breast cancer. Um, my prognosis is great. My most common cause of death, as with a lot of women, is heart disease. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for us to take care of our hearts. It's not the cancer that's going to kill us. Assuming you're getting the appropriate treatment for your cancer, it's the heart disease that we need to be careful about. So Now, we mentioned dense breasts. What about patients with dense breasts? How do they... Yeah. Can they get regular mammograms? That's a very good question. So women with a dense breast, so what is a dense breast? A dense breast is a breast which on a mammography, it looks white. Cancer looks white. So it's really tough to find cancer in a woman who has dense breast tissue. And that typically is case with young women, as it was for myself. And the follow-ups are really, really hard for these women because it's easy to miss cancer. So we have a lot of national uh, laws that are into effect now for those women who have dense breast tissue. They can get supplemental screening with an ultrasound or abbreviated MRI. They can also get a traditional MRI if they're considered high risk for breast cancer. And we have to put a lot of factors together and talk to women about what's called breast cancer risk assessment. Hmm. And what that is, is it takes into account your gender, your age, your density of your breast. If you've had kids, when did you, you know, when was your first child born? 
family history of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, puts all this information together. It gives us a number and it's called a tighter QSIC model. There's a number of different computerized models. There is tighter QSIC, there's Gale risk model. It looks at all of these different factors and it gives us a number. If it's greater than 20% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer, you're considered high risk. So that is a different category as opposed to women who are considered average risk. If you're considered average risk for breast cancer, you start mammography at age 40. If you're doing your breast exams once a month and you see a clinician once a year. If you're considered high risk based on these computerized models, if your risk is greater than 20% lifetime, then you not only qualify for a mammogram, but also an MRI. And you want to do a breast exam once a month and you want to see clinicians twice a year. And you may qualify for genetics. Uh, you may qualify for risk reduction, chemo prevention, like tamoxifen, which can decrease the risk of developing cancer in the future. And if you have a genetic mutation, such as BRCA, BRCA, or some other mutations, and NCCN does talk about a prophylactic mastectomy, that is where we remove the breast tissue and they have option of no reconstruction, flat closure to reconstruction. And again, that does not change the survival in women. That's just an option that women can you know, employ. And it does, we'll talk about the surgery and the different things uh, uh, that go into effect when we talk about surgery, but definitely surgery is an option for this women who are considered high risk, with the, especially so genetic if, mutation. If somebody comes in, they actually have a cancer, you can do a, I guess, computer model basically to get a sense of what their lifetime risk is. So the funny thing is you, this computerized model is only for women who don't have breast cancer. Who don't have breast cancer, right. Yeah. Of course, because yeah. it gives you the yeah. lifetime incidence of developing yeah. breast cancer. Yeah, correct, exactly, exactly. And that's based on family history, age, your um, parity, when you first had your, you know, your menarche, when you first had your periods, when your first child was born, um, if you have family history of breast cancer, and how dense your breasts are, your BMI, your age, all those things go into this computerized model. And, it and gives if that, you number that number is other under 20, that's good. If it's yes. over 20, that's not good. That is correct. Uh -huh. Yeah. So under 15%, we say average risk between 15 to 20, it's like intermediate risk, but over 20%, they're considered high risk for developing breast cancer in the future. So let's say a patient doesn't have breast cancer and says, Dr. Hall Harvey, I just want to know what my risk is. Mm -hmm. Is that something yeah. that they can come in and say, yes. mm -hmm. this is yes. what your lifetime risk is based on how old you are and your family history and all these other variables? That is correct. Yep. Well, that's interesting. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. So I don't know if you've been listening to the news. Olivia Munn, an actress, recently been diagnosed with breast cancer. I did cancer. hear something about that. Yeah. So she went to her doctor who did her breast cancer risk assessment. She was more than 24 percent lifetime risk. She was, I believe, 37 percent risk of developing breast cancer. She was genetics negative. Her genetics was negative. Mm. Her, her cancer was not found on a mammogram. It was found on an MRI. So good job. Kudos to the doctor who actually did the breast cancer risk assessment and kudos to this actress who actually followed through and not got an MRI in addition to a mammogram, which then she got diagnosed with breast cancer. So did she get the MRI because her assessment score yes. was high? That is correct. And yes. so they said, okay, you've got a number above 20. Let's yeah. get an MRI to see and yeah. ensure that there's nothing happening. And she did in fact have a breast cancer. That is correct. Wow. That's a real kind of paradigm shift to how we've done things in the past. Because in the past, we've done mammograms. Before that, maybe yeah. we relied on self-breast exam. Yeah. But now we're looking at a more sophisticated way to understand people's risk scores. Yeah. So I think it all goes back to just knowing yourself, your body, knowing your family history. Like, you know, I, you know, we both come from Indian background. Um, we don't really talk about a whole lot of family history of cancer. Like in our families, we never did growing up. I, that's something people don't talk about. I think it's really important when you're in family gatherings to get together, talk about your family history of breast cancer, because then that helps the other generation to, but then they can qualify for the breast cancer risk assessment. They can be followed closely. And I think okay. that's true in a lot of cultures, you know, Eastern yeah. cultures um, for sure, but I've I think certainly so. heard the same in African cultures. Yeah. So I think that is, you know, there's almost a sense that we don't want to talk about illness because it can then bring it upon. Yeah. You, you don't know, mention you, the C word, right? You don't like that's, it, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So now let's say someone is diagnosed with a cancer. 
what happens then? Yeah, so when I see them, typically they come in either with a mass or abnormal imaging. And I usually set the stage because I know looking at their imaging and their physical exam that they, this will be cancer. So I usually show them the imaging, kind of say I am worried about it, but this will most likely be early stage. We'll take care of this for you. And we get results back within a couple of days. I call them. I see them back within a week. Now, why a week? Because it takes a two to three days to get the results back. There's also a second component to the diagnosis that's called hormone receptors that takes an additional two to three days after the breast cancer results come back. So I need all that information. Then we bring the patient back with their family sometimes. Sometimes they come by themselves. I do advocate them to bring someone with them because it's patients don't remember everything you tell them because they are in such a shock. But it gives them enough time to write down their questions. So they come in. I go through the imaging again. I show them the location of cancer, how big it is. We do the staging. Staging depends on the size of the tumor. Is there lymph nodal involvement? Is there cancer outside the breast? The grade of the tumor. There's what's called hormone receptors. Is this cancer fed by estrogen? And that's the most common type of cancer is the hormone receptor positive cancer. There's also what's called HER2 new. It's a protein. And there's a triple negative status. Now, is, it, is it good to have receptors positive? Yes. And yeah. HER2 new positive? Why is that good? Yeah. That sounds yeah. like... Why is that good? Yeah, so it is good because anytime there is a target to treat in breast cancer world, so if they are hormone receptor positive cancer, they may or may not need chemotherapy. And we can go in, that's a huge different topic we can go into based on how big the cancer is, is there lymph node involvement. Uh, we usually get a test called Oncotype that tells us whether they need chemo. And, and also we can treat them in addition to surgery, radiation, they will get anti-estrogen medication which binds into this estrogen receptors and it decreases the growth of any cancer that's around in their body, not just in the chest, not just in the breast. Yeah, the way I like to think about it is if it's got one of those receptors, well, now we got we have something that we can use against it. Yes, and correct. And so having a estrogen, progesterone, or HER2 receptor means that there are options. There are options, treatment. but also we have been, you made such great strides in breast cancer treatment. Used to think, we used to think when I was a fellow 10 years ago, uh, if someone had a HER2 neoposite cancer, there was only one option. It was they would get trastuzumab uh, in addition to chemotherapy. Now there is pertuzumab, and there's a number of other targeted drugs that patients can get that are resulting in better survival. Well, also used to be triple negative breast cancer was considered really bad. Well, now we have Keytruda, uh, which is a immunotherapy that we're using for women either before surgery or after surgery that does help them uh, to have good pathologic response, meaning women do really well with these drugs where the cancer completely goes away if used before surgery and they have good prognosis and good survival. So we have made great strides. Again, just because you're diagnosed with cancer, it's not the death sentence. It's most likely early stage if you've caught it on mammogram and not on a breast exam. Even if you caught it on a breast exam, it's still good prognosis. We can do things to treat it as long as you're getting the appropriate treatments. And it's good survival, good prognosis in the United States for sure. So what role does surgery play here? You know, yeah. who is getting a mastectomy? Who is getting other types of treatments? So surgery, essentially, there's two types of surgery for these women who are diagnosed with cancer. It's a lumpectomy where we remove the cancer and some normal breast tissue around it, and they get radiation afterwards. And that's called local control. Uh, or they can get a mastectomy if the cancer is really large or if it's all over the breast. Or a patient just says, I don't want to get radiation. I want a mastectomy. Hmm. And they still can get that. At that time, they have option of no reconstruction, meaning they can be flat and they can wear a bra prosthesis. No one would know on clothing that they don't have breasts. They can get immediate reconstruction where you guys come into play and I'll uh, let you go into details of what your discussion is on the other side. But when they see me, I talk about all the different options, including lumpectomy of their candidates. Mastectomy, there's so many different types of mastectomy. There's skin sparing mastectomy where you remove the, can the breast tissue, the nipple, leave the skin envelope like a pillow in a pillowcase. So we leave with the pillowcase and you guys do the reconstruction. Or a nipple sparing mastectomy, we leave the skin, just remove the breast tissue, preserving the nipple, and you guys again do the reconstruction. And most recently we've added Goldilocks mastectomy. That has been a great thing to offer to women who are a little bit on the larger BMI, who are smokers, and who are not candidates for traditional reconstruction with you guys. Yeah, I think the whole... Um 
range of reconstructive options has changed a lot uh, in the last 10 years and certainly tremendously compared to maybe 10 years before that. And whether it's a deep lap reconstruction, direct implant reconstruction, oncoplastic reconstruction, aesthetic flat closure reconstruction, you know, I think there's a lot um, that we can talk to patients about. It's a, it's a pretty long conversation and they're already coming in with a ton of information, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're lucky we work together so closely and you really kind of set the stage for patients. So they've got a pretty good sense of what uh, some of their options are before they come and meet us. But I think really drilling down on what the right operation is for the right patient is probably the biggest goal of our conversations. You know, it's different for every single patient. You may have the same cancer as somebody else, but yeah. your life is different. You know, mm -hmm. you're, the things that you do every day is different. And it's understanding that piece. That's uh, a huge part of the reconstruction. Um, yeah. And I, I think, think it's, uh, it's shared decision-making, right? It's like we sit down and we chat with the patient and what's the right thing for the patient based on, you know, what she wants for her diagnosis and what she can have based on the type of tumor and location and things like that. And I think the shared decision-making is, is a big part of it. And I know yeah. Dr. Chrysopoulos in San Antonio talks yeah. about that. We work with Terry Kuti a lot. Um, who runs Deep Sea Journey and uh, shared decision making is a big part of her platform. And yes. it really is so important in making this decision because at the yes. end of the day, you know, it's you're you're trying to solve a problem for somebody and yeah. to solve their problem. You have to know what their problem really is. And it's more than just uh, needing a reconstruction sometimes. Yeah. And that, that that is great because, you know, like 20 years ago, the doctor basically told patients what they're going to get. So it was very paternalistic. We are moving so far away from that. And there's so many options for patients. But Dr. Tiwari, I do want to know what, what should a patient do before they come to see you? Yeah, that's a good question. Because there's a lot of things that patients can do to make this journey a lot easier. And the reconstructive piece is a journey. You know, it's typically one, usually two operations separated by three months. Um, and so we're talking about, you know, a, a real... Uh, commitment to getting back to normal is the way I think about it. Things that people can do to optimize their outcome. I always say the big two are smoking and diabetes. You know, if mm -hmm. you're a smoker, yeah. not smoking. And we have nothing against smokers, but it definitely affects their healing, their ability mm -hmm. to heal. Diabetes, um, controlling your diabetes, keeping your hemo hemoglobin A1C in a normal range those are really important for your healing. I think those are far and away number one and two. Um, a lot of other things that we can do, um, optimizing people's nutrition, all those things that I heard somebody say the other day that when they're trying to eat healthy, they in, avoid the center aisles in the grocery store. I've never heard that before. Mm. So you're, you're avoiding all the processed foods. Yeah. You're, you're really thinking about fresh fruits and vegetables, lean proteins. All those things are really important. Increasing your protein Intake is very important, not only for your wound healing, but um, in general uh, to avoid some of these processed foods, which I think have all types of uh, downstream effects on how people heal. Yeah. Another really big one, you know, I always think of it as the things that your, your mother told you to do when you were a kid, you know, eat healthy, eat fresh fruits and vegetables, get plenty of sunlight, you know, um, really use this as an opportunity to to reset the balance for yourself. Um, and the healthier you are, the healthier uh, you will do uh, post-surgery. And you can really, it's really kind of incredible. You know, when you operate on somebody, it's like you have a roadmap to their health and fitness right in front yeah. of you. Yeah. You know when someone, you know, has- Is taking care of themselves. Yeah, has done a really yeah. good job taking care yeah. of themselves. Um, it's obvious in the way their tissue is, it's obvious in the way they heal. So um, I think that from a reconstructive standpoint, we want to get people back to normal as quickly as possible with the fewest numbers of problems. And so much of that is dependent on, you know, all these things. And we try to control them as much as we can, but um, it's important to make it a priority. Yeah. So what types of reconstruction do you perform? Yeah, I, I always think of reconstruction in like three different categories. There's implant-based reconstruction, tissue-based reconstruction, and sometimes a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, implants are typically silicone implants. Um, uh, 
uh, tissue reconstruction can be from the abdominal area, the deep flap. It can be from the buttock area, the gap flap. There's some other options also. And what we do depends in some, uh, some degree what the patient wants, you know, what other things have gone on. Has there been radiation treatment? Is this a nipple sparing mastectomy? Uh, issues like body mass index come into play. Um, what their anatomy is, all that comes into play. So there's a lot of different uh, options here. And our whole goal in that first visit is to drill down and figure out what the best option is. Mm -hmm. And for some folks, it's no reconstruction at all. And mm -hmm. we'll call that an aesthetic flat closure. For some folks, they just don't know. And we'll place a tissue expander as a temporary spacer so they can get through some of their treatment and then make a decision for reconstruction down the road. So I don't ever want people to feel like there's pressure to make a decision. There really isn't. You know, My goal is to get patients back to normal, back to symmetry, back to balance, um, and doing it you know, in a way that it meets their everyday needs and also takes into account what's happening with their cancer treatment. Yes, absolutely. And I, I, I like what you said. There is no pressure to make a decision right then. So breast cancer is not a surgical emergency is what I say. We make sure you get all the information, understand things. I sometimes see patients back more than once or twice, talk to them multiple times on the phone to make sure that they're understanding and making the right decision for them. Uh, and I think that's important to know. So the stress is off of them. Yeah, and no, de no decision is still a valid decision. You that know? is exactly correct. Not yeah. knowing is is a valid decision. Nobody nobody is uh, going to pressure a patient to make a decision. Now there are uh, there is the pressure of getting to the operating room, getting the cancer dealt with, and that's a very understandable pressure. And and part of our goal, what we, you and I do behind the scenes with our offices is really trying to coordinate things. Yeah. So we make that time frame uh, as quick as possible. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot that goes on to um, get people to the OR, but at the end of the day, it's making the right decision the first time around, because we don't want to deal with problems. Although people have problems, you know, we work through problems, but a good plan is probably the best way to avoid problems down the road. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I just want you to walk me through, patient comes to your office, you have two scenarios. One is implant-based reconstruction, another is autologous or using their own body tissue that you talked about before. I want to first have you walk me through, a patient comes to you, now she wants to have implant-based reconstruction. What is the next step? Yeah, good question. So um, we know uh, for whatever reason that the implant is the best option for her, it's what she wants. We've talked about all the different options. Um, most of the time I'll talk to them about a tissue expander and a tissue expander. I always think of as a big water balloon, it expands the tissue and through whatever incision you make, whether it's a skin sparing incision or a nipple sparing incision, I'll place that tissue expander. We use something called an acellular dermal matrix. And back in, let's say 10 years ago, we used to put these tissue expanders below the muscle. It was very uncomfortable. There's a lot of problems with below the muscle. And what we're able to do now is place the tissue expanders above the muscle, much more favorable, much less discomfort. And we can do that because of this acellular, acellular matrix, which essentially supports the tissue expander. Um, and I like the tissue expander because it allows me to create a home for the implant. It also very importantly allows me to have a discussion with the patient as we're going through the expansion. So we can figure out what the right size is. And for some patients, I have an idea for other people. I don't. Um, and we may decide the right size is 320 cc's, or she may say, listen, I was 320 cc's, uh, in my expansion. I want to go back down to 270 cc's or I want to go up to 390 cc's and she'll go home. She'll put on her clothes. She'll see what, uh, feels the best. And then we just pick an implant for a second procedure that meets that expansion. So it gives a lot of opportunity for discussion to figure out what the right size is for that patient. For most patients, um, the recovery here is two to four weeks in general before they're kind of getting back to normal strength and energy patterns. A lot of that depends on the drain placement. The drains are in place for about two weeks. Everybody hates drains and very understandable why they hate them, but super important to avoid infection because that's the main thing I worry about with 
any type of implant or prosthetic is, is an infection. So that's, I think, the, the general um, kind of broad strokes on what happens uh, after the conversation and in the first few weeks after the operating room. And you do place patients on antibiotics when they have drains in place? For yes, absolutely. Reconstruction. They'll get antibiotics before the operation and they'll go home with antibiotics. And we'll usually keep them on antibiotics until the drains come out. And that's typically two to three weeks. Each, each patient is different. Yeah, typically about two weeks. Um, two weeks. The drains I tend to have out by about two weeks. We'll sometimes do some expansion while the drains are still in place in order to decrease some of the room for fluid collection to develop. Um, so a lot of what we're doing in the first two to four weeks after the operation is looking for any infection, signs of infection. And now, the infection, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, the, uh, the drains, we remove them in the office and everyone's always very scared about how the drains are removed. But most patients, I'll take out the drains, they won't even know that I've taken them out. Yes. And what are some risks of infection with an implant-based reconstruction? But you touched on this before. Yeah, I always tell patients the critical time frame is sort of that two to four week time period after the surgery, um, where we worry about it a bit more on the cancer side because there's typically a lymph node removal. Um, that lymph node removal can lead to more fluid developing. If we then have redness at the skin, swelling, increasing tenderness. Uh, what I'll typically do is see the patient that day and probably uh, go to the hospital and start some intravenous antibiotics. Luckily, most of the time we can control the uh, infection just with antibiotics, but on occasion we have to take them back to the operating room and deal with it there. So it's that two to four week time period that's the critical time frame. After four weeks, I get less nervous about an infection and we can start the expansion process, kind of get back on track. What I'll say, Dr. Tuari, is uh, your team and there's some other plastic surgeons that work with you guys have been phenomenal in taking patients back at quickly whenever they have you know complications. And I think that's really important for these patients. So you catch things early on, so less risk of damage, correct? Do you, is that right? Yeah, I think it's really important to act quickly um, to limit problems. You know, nobody wants problems. It's just a, it's yeah. a fact of life. These are complex surgeries. These are complex problems. But... Um, the ability to act quickly, I think, makes a really big difference. So yeah, uh, we make yeah. that a big priority. Yeah. So, I mean, I want to someday share my my story of my own cancer diagnosis and reconstruction. And and you and Dr. Kocek have been nothing but, like, phenomenal. Uh, it's going to be nine years uh, this month. But Oh, my gosh, nine years. That's great. <laughs> I Congratulations. Know. I know. And can I tell you, I have, I am probably the best I am, you know, ever in my life. I work, you know, harder than a 30 year old. I, you know, more energetic. I work out, I take care of myself. So anyway, in a nutshell, I'm, my life is really great, but I did have infection after the tissue expanders. Yeah. And, and of course I've been to a conference right after surgery. I think that probably was not a smart thing to do. There's a lot of things that I have done in my own self that I tell patients not to do from my own experience. Um, but in spite of infection, my tissue expanders had to come up. In spite of all that, everything worked out fine. I, you know, I'm happy with how I look. You guys have done a phenomenal job. And the reason I'm bringing this up to say, if you have had mastectomy with tissue expanders, infection, tissue expanders need to come out. It's really not the end of the world in the big spectrum of things. In that moment, it may feel like it. It may feel like your whole life is ending. You, you look, uh, you know, you look at yourself and you're, you know, you just hate the way you look, whatever. But all of that is temporary. Everything gets, everything is fixable. And um, yeah, we're lucky that, you know, we obviously do a lot of uh, autologous reconstruction, D-flap reconstruction. And I kind of think of the D-flap as for a lot of people, it's the fix it operation. You know, um, I'm less worried about infections with the D-flap. I'm less worried about uh, healing problems with the D-flap. And the reason is that the tissue, it's so resilient and it um, has a blood supply to it. So it heals much better. It allows us to deal with problems like infections and radiation. So the D-flap in so many ways is our way of dealing with problems. So when patients do have tissue expander issues, it is very, you know, unfortunate and it's really um, scary for them. But I think having the D-flap as a possibility for us is the best way to 
guarantee folks that we're going to get to the other side of this. Yeah. I have also seen you guys have placed, you took them back and did another tissue expanders and an implant. And sometimes they do well with that, right? Yeah. I think um, particularly if you catch an infection early yeah. and with the implants and the tissue expanders above the muscle, there's something there that allows us to deal with the infections better. I suspect it's because without the muscle movement yeah. being a problem, you don't have as much fluid generated and the and the enemy here is is kind of fluid contamination and with the uh, tissue expander implant above the muscle it's just not as much of a problem yeah and um, i think it makes a really big difference um it's why we're able to treat a lot more of these infections than i used to when we yeah. do these below the muscle yeah 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 i was the one who had below the muscle and that is very painful but i'm happy to see that we you know advanced now to where we put you guys put the tissue expanders on top of the muscle um and then before i stop talking about implant basic because one other question i have is are implants safe <laughs> I, I get this question a lot yeah it's a it's a great question and to be honest it's a bit of a controversial question so i would say in general implants are safe um for the vast majority of patients, implants are safe. Now, there are patients that have issues with implants. And I use that word issues as kind of like a catch-all term because there's a lot of uh, problems that people report. And I think you can put those problems into two categories. You can put them into the, let's say, mechanical, biomechanical category, and you can put it into the um, inflammatory category. So the biomechanical category is I have chest pain, shoulder pain, pain that radiates to my back, um, tenderness. Uh, I think those are all associated with implants uh, below or above the muscle, although I think it's oftentimes below the muscle. And I think as people get older and you lose muscle mass, um, which is a natural part of aging, you know, our, our hormonal changes obviously mm -hmm. play a role in that. And I think the same implant when you had a certain level of muscle mass in, let's say your twenties, and now you're in your forties, there's more tenderness, there's more discomfort associated with that. That's kind of my theory as to why patients as they get older tend to have these mechanical issues, biomechanical mm. issues with implants. Now, there is a separate category of patients that have inflammatory symptoms and it can um, uh, demonstrate itself as joint issues, um, even joint issues other than the, the chest. Um, it can demonstrate itself in other ways that are more inflammatory. I think this is a much more difficult process to understand. I don't have a great, a great explanation for it. I suspect that it is something related to um, almost like a uh, delayed hypersensitivity response. You know, it's the first time you have a peanut, you don't have an allergy to it, mm -hmm. but it's the second yeah. time you have a peanut that you have yeah. an allergy to it. And I think yeah. for certain foreign materials, there's no question that the textured implants, which are the ones associated with ALCL lymphoma, even when there isn't a lymphoma, which is a blood cancer that develops, when I remove a textured implants, there's a lot of edema, a lot of swelling, a lot of just reactivity to the, um, to the texturized implant. I think that the reactivity is less to a smooth implant, but um, there's still some reactivity to it. We certainly make a capsule around it. Um, and I suspect that some of the um, inflammatory causes are related to the fact that it is a foreign body. So again, this is a long-winded way of saying that I think implants are generally safe, mm -hmm. um, but there are patients that have issues that develop over time. And those are folks that we um, would remove the implants on, maybe think about other types of reconstruction. Now, of course, implants can rupture. They're not lifelong devices. Um, I always tell people that they have a 1% per year chance of rupture. And I think these are the issues that give people some pause. Um, and unfortunately, it's a difficult decision because we're talking about either putting a foreign body in your body or doing, you know, a somewhat complicated operation. And so they're both, um, they're both tough 
tough decisions to make, which is why I think this yeah. is such a, such an emotional, um, uh, time for patients. And that's really, it's really tough. And I think, uh, we take a lot of time trying to explain it and coming up with the best answer for people. And I'm so thankful that you set the stage for them because they have a good sense of what they want when they come to see us. And I think a lot of that's because of your conversation with them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I will say working with you guys so frequently and have, we have done hundreds of cases now, but I think um, I know exactly like, you know, what your approach is for these patients so I can help them and we communicate so much behind the scenes. And that's why for our listeners, I think it's important to find your team of surgeons who work together and or feel comfortable with each other. And um, I, I think that's really important uh, for patients when they're looking for their breast plastic surgery team, uh, team that works together very frequently and have good communication skills. Yeah, I think that's a good question to even ask, like who, yeah. you know, for patients to ask, like, who, who is your team? Like yeah. who is on your team? Because this is definitely a team approach. Like there's no, yeah. um, nobody is able to do these things without a team. So it's super yeah, important absolutely. that there's a team involved. Yes. And you have to trust your team to take care of you too. You have to have that much confidence in your team. Um, so before we, okay. So I think that's really all I wanted to ask you about the implant-based reconstruction. So the timeline you said is about three months or so from the time they get tissue expander to the permanent implant. Yeah. It's about, about three, three months. months. Yeah. Okay. And I just want for our listeners, just to clarify, you don't use the implants that cause the lymphoma. No, right? definitely the not. So yes. uh, I've never actually used textured implants. I was never a big fan of them to be honest, but certainly after some of this data has come out on the risk of a uh, breast implant associated lymphoma, the textured implants are the ones that have been taken off the market. Okay, perfect. So it's, it's a tough issue because if people have textured implants, the question is, do you have to have them taken out? Do you have to have them removed? Um, I have told patients uh, that if you have textured implants, you certainly have to have a higher um, index of suspicion of any changes. And the way a lymphoma presents is usually one side gets very swollen. But, you know, if it were a family member of mine, I would probably have them take out the textured implants and have yeah. them replaced. Yeah, yeah, I agree. All right. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and let's talk about autologous reconstruction. Oh, yeah. So autologous meaning that, you know, women can use their own body tissue. And what are different types of autologous reconstruction you perform? I know you said it earlier. Yeah, there's a whole different type. I think our go-to really is a deep flap. That's kind of, you know, the, the main tissue reconstruction because most people have enough tissue at their tummy that it matches their breast reconstruction. And, you know, when we do the operation, we'll design the deep flap based on the height of their chest, the width of their chest. You do an incredibly mast incredible mastectomy. You're such a good surgeon from a technical standpoint that it gives us a nice, um, you know, envelope. I like that word envelope or pillowcase for the reconstruction with the deep flap is the pillow. And um, I think that it's a bigger surgery, no doubt about it, compared to the tissue expanders implants. I think in the long term, in my experience, people do do better um, in terms of the naturalness of the reconstruction. Uh, it's warm, it's soft. We do a fair amount of resensation surgery now. And I mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. the um, outcomes have been good. I mean, yeah. I would say on every, almost every single deep flap, we've been doing some resensation and we've definitely had patients who've reported improved sensation. Yes. So I think that's, uh, that's a nice thing that we've been able to do recently, maybe in the last year, mm -hmm. year and a half, two years. Um, so in many ways, the deep flap, uh, gives us a lot more, uh, of an ability to get to a natural reconstruction. If we can't do deep flap, patients had a tummy tuck, the patients had a lot of abdominal surgery for whatever reason, although C-sections aren't something that I worry about, but other types of abdominal surgery where there's different scars on the abdomen. Then we'll go to the buttock area. Sometimes we'll use the inner thighs. Um, we don't use the back that much anymore, um, but those are kind of the other spots, using the thighs, using the, the buttock area. And it sounds like deep is the most common autologous surgery that you do. Yeah, is deep is by far the okay. most common. I think people recover the best. It's yeah. the most kind of consistent um, mm -hmm. in terms of the outcomes. Um, so it's probably the, the one that we do the most. And we're doing it on patients who've had radiation treatment or really on patients who just don't want an implant because they're worried about um, having something foreign in their body. 
Yeah, and I will say, I have said this many times on the podcast, is we are so lucky to have you guys or microsurgeons who can do implant-based reconstruction, autologous reconstruction. I have at least maybe one or two patients a week who will need radiation after a mastectomy. Yeah. And it, I think it's those pe- patients are really great for this type of procedure. Am I right in that? Yeah, radiation is really tough because it does, it's super important. You know, the radiation doctors we work with do an incredible job very important for the patient in terms of controlling local occurrence, but it certainly changes the tissue and can lead to not only cosmetic aesthetic problems, but also functional problems with tightness and and decreased range of motion. So uh, we're lucky that we're able to do these deep flaps that can fix not only the cosmetic pieces, but some of those functional pieces, particularly in the radiated patient. Yes. Yes. So the surgery is how long for the deep flap? For two sides now, it takes us probably about six hours. For um, one side, it can take us between three to four hours. Um, we, we work in a team, you know, with uh, either Dr. Kochak or Dr. Kale. And so our team approach is why we're able to do these things maybe a little bit quicker than the average. Yes. Yeah, that is really great. I cannot believe that you do that within six to, you know, seven hours. I think that's pretty incredible. And are these patients hospitalized? Do they go home? They are. They're in the hospital for three days. And so um, that's so we can monitor the tissue to make sure there's no problem with the blood vessels that we hook up. We have a monitor on there that goes to our phones. It goes to our computer. So we know exactly what's going on. Um, the uh, Most patients go home with um, actually very little pain medication. Um, I think it does take at least a month before they're getting back to kind of normal patterns of uh, everyday activity. Um, And then typically at about three months, again, uh, we'll do some kind of touch-up operation, not in everybody, but in people who Mm -hmm. um, we can make things look a little bit better. That's more of the cosmetic piece. And all these things are, of course, covered by uh, health insurance under the Women's Health Care Act of 1998. So I always make that a point because health insurance is so expensive these days that it's important that people know that this is a covered part of uh, their, their benefits. Yeah, thanks for saying that because that's a common question that I get asked as the insurance cover for you know mastectomy reconstruction on the opposite side of the cancer. And it does. The yes, the the Health Rights Act of nineteen ninety eight did make that possible for women for for which I am so grateful. Um and so they go home with drains uh, in the chest as well as in the belly, correct? With the deep Yeah, flap. and the drains okay. are terrible. Um yeah. Luckily, we don't need them in as long as we need them for the tissue expanders on average. Yeah. You know, the, we yeah. can take out um, a lot of the drains after the first week. Um, and usually we'll have a, a final drain at the tummy that we'll take out at the second week. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I, I mean, obviously, you guys do such a phenomenal job and these guys look so great. Um I mean, I, I do think deep flaps, my personal favorite are deep flaps, only because I think women look so natural and so good afterwards. And they do have to wear a Spanx for like for the abdominal region. Yeah, I think the like, abdominal yeah. swelling is the thing that um, even a few months out, it still yeah. bothers people. And it really is. It's like a tummy tuck. You know, it's in, yeah. in some ways, it's the same operation, yeah. um, except we're not discarding that tissue. We're using it for the reconstruction. So wearing some kind of compression. Um whether it's a Spanx or something that's compressive like that for at least three months is very important. Yeah. Yeah. And the timeline for the second surgery would be about three to four months after the first surgery. The earliest I would do it is three months, but you know, if we can wait four five, six months, I I prefer waiting because everything softens up, everything gets easier to deal with. Um, so three months is the earliest, but you know, if we can wait longer, we wait longer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of my pet peeves, and I want to know what your pet peeve is, pa- patients will say, oh, I'm going to get a free boob job now that I have cancer, uh, yeah. you know, and I hate that because it's not the same as like a breast augmentation, right? A boob job meaning someone who gets implants without having to, you know, be- before removing the breast tissue for just cosmetic purposes. It's very different than reconstruction where you don't have any breast tissue. With the mastectomy, we have to remove 90 to 95 percent of the breast tissue. I mean, we can't remove 100 percent just because then you would have skin flap necrosis or or the, the skin would lose blood supply. Um, but it's not the same as augmentation. So when women yeah, it, say that. It's such a good, you know, I think I've always thought about this because I think when patients say, well, you know, I get a, a boob job, I think there's a lot going on there. I think one, everybody wants to minimize mm. because it's scary. Yeah, And so you want to put it in words that are not that scary. And boob job is not that scary. Um, 
So I understand why people do that um, yeah. because you want to go into this thinking like, this is something I can do. And it's something you can do if you make it less scary. And I think in some ways that's where that boob job piece comes from. But I think it is important to, to kind of explain that it is different. Like you just said, yeah. it's not a breast augmentation surgery they're, They are very different. There's many reasons why they're different. Um, and kind of taking them through that process is important, but I, I don't, uh, I it did used to kind of, you know, I would always think about why patients said that. And I decided, well, I understand why they're saying it because this is scary and boob jobs just aren't that scary. It's like, uh, did you ever watch Ghostbusters yeah. where <laughs> they conjured up Dan Aykroyd conjured up the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man because yes. it's like the least scary thing he could think of. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's the same. <laughs> no, I think that's, I mean, thank you for, yeah, that's, that's a really great way to look at it. People are so scared with the diagnosis and whatever it takes to kind of, you know, alleviate that stress or the, the scaredness that they feel as they're approaching the surgery. You know, I, I think you're in a hundred percent correct is people are trying to minimize the situation maybe by saying it's a boob job, you know? So do you have any pet peeves? Do I have pet peeves? Um, I think one pet peeve is uh, drains are so confusing for patients and we get a yeah. lot of, you know, questions about, uh, about drains. If there's one, if there's something that I could do to just kind of let patients know that you're going to be okay. The drains are, they're terrible and they're weird and they look funny, but they're super important and just be patient with them. Uh, they'll come out and it's going to go just fine. Just don't worry about them as worrisome as it is. Um, things will be okay. Just let the drains do their job. I usually say if you have drain pain, that's really great because you really have no problems. Like that is, <laughs> that's like the, you know, if that's your worst thing that you have right now is pain from your drains, you're doing great. 100%. Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. Like if, <laughs> yeah. if the only thing yeah. causing us trouble is your yeah. drains, we're, yeah. we're yeah. way ahead of the curve. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, but you know, this has been a great conversation and, uh, for someone who is being diagnosed with breast cancer is looking at a mastectomy reconstruction, some things that I would say is what you had said early on in this podcast is make sure taking care of yourself, exercising, do exercises. I'm very big proponent of strength training with, you know, upper body chest, um, increase protein intake. I say one gram for every one pound of your body weight. So hundred to 120 grams of protein is what we need to be taking in uh, for he wound healing. And, you know, if you're smoking, even if you cut down smoking two weeks before surgery, studies have shown there's benefit in decreasing the risk of infections, pneumonias, uh, atelectasis, which is the collapsing of the, the, uh, the alveoli in the lungs and other infections that can result as a result of smoking. Uh, and as much as you can control, it's the worst time to ask you to stop smoking, but I think it is beneficial even if they stop smoking for a couple of weeks. What are some other things you would say? Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I think, I think you cover them. I mean, diets is such a big one because that's, that's one that we can kind of improve quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think hydration matters too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, keeping your blood pressure up, um, cause when you go under anesthesia, your blood pressure drops. So being, yeah. you know, well hydrated is really important in the several weeks up to surgery kind of thinking about what supplements you're taking. Um, there are some supplements that can lead to uh, bleeding. So uh, talking to us about um, your various types of herbal supplements is an important one. But yeah, I think the biggest one is just kind of general fitness. And, you know, maybe we can do a podcast on our fitness regimens one of these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would love that a lot. Um, that would be amazing. And um, what other things do you want to talk about? Is there anything else you want to talk about? Do you want to talk yeah. about uh, Princess Kate Middleton? Yeah, I was curious of what you thought about that because that's yeah. uh, it's so it's so confusing what's going on here. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I feel terrible that she's you know clearly been diagnosed with cancer. She's super young; yeah. she's in her early forties. Yes, she's early forties. So you know, recently, and I was just interviewed for Channel Ten. It should be out next week. But about increasing incidence of cancer in younger men and women under age fifty, um, it's breast cancer. 
gastrointestinal cancer, colorectal cancer, cervical cancer, a lot of it for the breast cancer, women are delaying childbearing, which is a risk factor for breast cancer. You're not mm. cutting those cycles of estrogen, progesterone, or never having kids, that's a risk factor. Uh, having excess estrogen on board obesity, you store a lot more estrogen in your fat cells, that's a risk factor. Um, gender, just being a woman, be at risk for breast cancer, but usually older age in America, age 62 is the average age of diagnosis for breast cancer. But oh, this study that came out in JAMA looking at this young woman diagnosed with breast cancer under age 50, it's over, they looked at over half a million women and men. And um, the reasoning was obesity or diet, delaying having kids or not having kids, environmental pollution, um, those are some of the things that they attribute the cancer to. Yeah, even among young women, the age of first pregnancy, I think, has gone gone up. It's, it's, if it's higher than age 30, that's definitely a risk factor. Yeah. Hmm. And women are, you know, delaying childbearing for, you know, you know, with their carriers and things like that. And so, um, yeah, that's definitely a risk factor. And I think something to think about, we are living in a society, we are so sedentary with our jobs and you know, driving from place A to place B, not moving. So exercising, I think, is just so important. And I think not just for cancer prevention, but, you know, decreasing the risk of getting diabetes and heart disease and, you know, metabolic syndrome and all the other things. Um, and I listened to Dr. Peter Atia, who's, you know, he's this person on uh, longevity and he talks a lot about these things and we should definitely do a podcast on the things that he talks yeah, about. Yeah, I haven't read, read his book, but I used to follow him a lot. So yeah, we should, that'd be a great podcast to do. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some of his work. Yeah, yeah. But Princess Kate Milton, she supposedly had an abdominal surgery. Um, we, I mean, it's I don't want to speculate what she had, but you know, sometimes like pelvic masses, things like that, you really don't know until it's been taken out and taken to pathology, the biopsy uh, that can sometimes reveal whether it's benign or cancerous. I, what I love about her, she's so gracious, so beautiful. Her message was so touching. Things that I wish I want our patients take away a newly diagnosed cancer patient is when you get told you have cancer, take time to deal with it, understand the diagnosis, mm -hmm. talk to your family, um, and also tell your kids, but make sure you have all the information before talking to your kids. And it should be age appropriate discussion. And most of the time, kids don't understand what's happening other than to say, are you going to be okay? You know, that's no. what they want to know. And, um, I think a lot of times social media is big these days. We want to put everything on social media. And I think that's okay once you dealt with it yourself privately with your family and friends. But when you're on social media talking about every aspect of your life, sometimes it can be overwhelming because every person will give you some advice that may not be sound or not. And that can be overwhelming. So I think dealing with it privately and getting through it you know, um, she said, I want to take care of my mind, body and spirit. I think that's really great. And then never losing hope regardless of the diagnosis. So yeah, well, those are great points. We wish her the yeah. best and hopefully she gets the yes. privacy that she and her family needs to yeah. deal with this. She absolutely does. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been great podcast uh, for our patients who are going to- Number two, the number two injury. podcast. Number two <laughs> podcast. Yes. Yes. Lots of great information in this. So- for all your listeners, thank you so much for tuning in today and tune tune in next month again. And uh, we'll have we'll continue our conversation on the breast plastic educational series. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into the breast cancer podcast. And remember, you're not alone in this fight. I encourage you to be an active part of this podcast. Please share your stories, questions and suggestions for future topics at my website called drdeepahalaharvey.com. And please share this podcast with others, especially if you found it useful. And please also give it a five-star rating, if you will. Uh, stay connected as we navigate the complexities of breast cancer. Until next time, take care and keep shining brightly. Disclaimer, this podcast is not intended for complete medical advice. So please talk to your medical